First of all, uh, uh, yesterday the president nominated him for his third star in the, and move up to be the DAG for. Uh, next to him is uh, Shields, the deputy PEO for ammo. Ammunition is critical, and it, in the budget years that we're in right now, ammo is always taking hits. Uh, we cannot allow that to happen uh, again. Uh, sitting next to him is a, a guy from Lockheed Martin that uh, knows a little bit about fixing things, including aircraft, uh, also ammo. Uh, Major General Rogers is a, a great American, and he runs the Lockheed Martin facility here in. Uh, in uh, Huntsville. Next to him is the missile defense guy, John Urias, retired two-star, now was uh, um, taking his talents to Oshkosh. Uh, as I, he just told me, he's, he's a missileer that's doing trucks now, and he's making them go straight, which is a good thing. <laughs> Next to him is Ted Harrison, uh, newly um, installed as the CG for Army Contracting Command. He's a great American. All good things that happen in the Army start with a contract. All bad things in the Army start with the contract. <laughs> Next to him is Jim Dwyer, a great American, is the G4, Deputy G34 now, I guess, for uh, uh, General Perna in AMC. Um, retired Colonel from Red, uh, re, uh, out of Red River, commanded Red River, and then was uh, an aide to uh, the CG of AMC. He, he takes care of all things uh, logistics within AMC. That's pretty big. That's pretty big. And then lastly, um, a guy that has served our nation for 47 years, uh, came in the Army in 1967, uh, aviation logistics guy, uh, used to work with Joe Cribbins back in the day, and has now been working in the Pentagon for, um, since it was built. And uh, Wimpy Pibus has done more for Army logistics and acquisition and policy uh, than any three people I know of, and he's a, he's a great American. So with that, we're going to keep it to six minutes each. Uh, right, General Perna? Yes, sir. All right, you're on. Does it go on yeah, its own? Yeah, it just goes on its own. Okay. Sir, first of all, to uh, General Sullivan, sir, as I've done in previous uh, AUSAs where I've had the honor to speak on a panel, I just want to say thank you for this great uh, contribution to the Army. It allows us to uh, express ideas, uh, articulate our thoughts, and share with ourselves and our partners. And so it is really a great honor to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, today, as we uh, introduce this panel, and quite frankly, uh, the greatest attribute of this panel is sitting to my right, uh, the goal is to art art talk about partnering and how do we partner and move into the future. And, and what I want to bring to you right away is, is partnering is not the sole solution. It is one course of action to help us move forward. And so it is not the panacea or the golden ring, but it has great potential uh, as we try to figure out ways to do things differently. Uh, partnering is, uh, if you can go to the next slide, please, and, I, and I'll stay on this slide, it is, is about bringing ourselves together. It is building a bridge between the industri industrial capability and the organic capability. And there's advantages for both of us. Uh, and we have to learn how to flex those advantages where they're not always a cookie cutter solution. Sometimes it'll benefit the organic, ba the organic industrial base, and sometimes it will benefit the commercial industrial base. And once we understand that uh, playbook, we'll be better as we move forward. We cannot hold ourselves accountable to certain ways of execution if we are going to be successful as we move into the future. Uh, and I think that's what we have to really come to grips with right away. Uh, and so that we can take advantage of these capabilities that are out there. What, you know, why do we do partnering? Well, because we have an organic industrial base that was invested in many years ago and been uh, financed over years that has great capability, that has done nothing like the world has ever seen. And we don't want to lose that. But at the same time, we all know that we're not going to have the constant stream of funds to maintain that capability to the top level. And so we want to make sure that we bring in innovation at different levels from different organizations and share that capability. But our number one priority is not to lose it. 
And so we've got to stay focused on that. As General McQuistion talked about, we have over 300 partnerships already. 300 partnerships means innovation and capability. It means infusion in the local communities through workforce. It means infusion through dollars. And that is what the strength is of the partnering. And that is what we've done so far. But quite frankly, we've only touched on the tip of the iceberg. The capability out there, if we expand our thoughts, can really improve our, cap our overall, overall ability to execute our mission. And then why are we doing this? At the end of the day, there is only one reason, and that is to fight and win the nation's wars. And so you have to have this uh, capability as we move forward. As General Vi talked about this morning, an honorable shoe, and then touched on with, by General McQuistion, it is today that we need to, to do things to be ready for tomorrow. Uh, and it's through partnership that we'll make that happen. And so with that said, I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Shields. Great, thanks. Thank you to uh, the AUSA for the opportunity to serve in this distinguished panel. Uh, my boss is Brigadier General John McGinnis. He'd be up here, but he was on travel when the phone call came in asking for a panel member, so <laughs> you got me. But uh, I'd like to acknowledge a few people. I'd like to acknowledge my partners in the ammunition enterprise, uh, you know, uh, General French and Trish Huber out of JMC, and uh, Dr. Melendez uh, out of uh, uh, Picatinny Arsenal, Army Research Development Engineering Center. Together, you know, we form the Ammunition Enterprise and work with our industry partners to try and do what's right in the best interest of the ammunition industrial base. Next chart, please. I've only got two charts. One of them uh, basically focuses on the organic base, and the, and the second one focuses on, on, the, on the commercial and how we, we do our best to, to manage and, and mitigate the adverse impacts of, uh, of the downturn and, and, uh, and lessening of uh, defense spending. Uh, but right now, if, if you know, we rewind the clock to 2002 when the war started, we had roughly uh, 30 out of 42 of ammunition areas that were rated as either red or black. That meaning that red couldn't meet the training reserve, black couldn't meet the, uh, the war reserve. Naturally, there was a large infusion of cash, but I'd like to think it was more than that that we've turned that around since then. Right now, we're at 39 out of 42 of our ammunition areas are rated as green, and the other wow. three are, are yellow. So it's just a, a huge, huge uptick in, in, in our ability to support the warfighters' ammunition needs. Again, a lot of money was thrown at the problem, but also we've implemented a lot of processes and procedures and use a lot of tools that I'll get to in the subsequent chart to try and do a better job of managing the industrial base and make the right informed decisions. Um, if you look at the chart there in the upper left-hand upper, upper left side, you'll see the, uh, the ammunition organic industrial base as, is, as really post-World War II and post-Korean War. We had 60 facilities that produced ammunition or, or, uh, or uh, were logistics facilities and depots and what have you. And through the course of, uh, of uh, you know, recent history, we've, uh, we've had downturns. Uh, some of it was driven by uh, you know, force reduction, uh, ends of conflict, end of the Cold War. And the most recent downturn there was BRAC 2005. We're at, right now, we're down to 15 uh, facilities. Uh, we've got the uh, seven uh, GOCOs, government-owned, contractor-operated uh, ammunition plants. We have five uh, logistics uh, uh, depots, and we've got three multi-purpose uh, facilities. Uh, and on top of that, we've got 200 commercial suppliers of ammunition that we have to uh, manage and, and look, uh, look out for as well. And, uh, and, and really, when you, when you look at that, you know, we've got uh, roughly two-thirds of all the dollars that, that get spent on ammunition go into the uh, commercial sector. So, you know, we don't take that lightly that the, our, our commercial partners are, are, are pivotal, actually a major portion of, uh, of what it takes to deliver quality ammunition. And, uh, and of course, the chart on the lower left-hand side there is really our, our spending uh, really over the last uh, you know, 20 years. And you can see it's all normalized to FY12 dollars. So you can see that right now we're already down to pre-war spending. And I think the, uh, the challenge we have before us is to make sure that, you know, that what I described before in terms of uh, all those ammunition families being red and black uh, back when we were spending these kind of dollars. We need to make sure that we don't get in that situation again and make wise, informed uh, investment decisions uh, moving forward. Uh, so in PEO Ammunition, we're the, uh, we're the single manager for conventional uh, ammunition. So that authority comes down from the Secretary of Defense to the Secretary of the Army to the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology, and the PEO Ammunition is the, the executor of that. So what we look to do is we look to integrate all of the requirements for all of the services and be a single buyer. 
the whole idea being that, uh, that we, uh, you know, we want to achieve economies of scale and, and make uh, the best uh, uh, buying decisions that we can to the benefit of, of, of all the services. You know, I think you know, maybe some areas for improvement or expansion is you know, maybe we have to look beyond DOD and look at some of the other federal agencies, whether they be the FBI or, or Border Patrol or places like that, and what can we do to better support them? If we, if we can buy the ammunition for the Marine Corps and the Air Force and the Navy, why can't we buy for those other organizations as well? So that's something I think we, we could improve upon. You know, one of the challenges we face is to, is to right-size the, uh, the organic industrial base. You know, I don't think anybody, uh, whether you're an ASALT or AMC, will argue the, 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 the importance and need for places like Radford. You know, the basic building blocks of everything we need from an ammunition perspective. We need the propellants. You know, nobody's going to uh, I don't think there's enough business out there in the propellant world for a commercial producer to stay in business and, and keep that, the capacity we need open and ready for any contingency. So I think Radford is, 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 is an important uh, uh, installation that's in our, in our future. I think, uh, I think Holston is, is another one for explosives. So I, I think, you know, once you get past that, you know, large caliber uh, loading and, and, uh, of, of, uh, of ammunition, that's something nobody's really going to pick up. But I think the other facilities that do integration assembly, I think we need to look across the commercial sector and see if there's opportunities for consolidation, more partnering with, with uh, the commercial sector and, and, uh, and, and look uh, to improve that. Uh, next chart. So how do we, how do we uh, manage the industrial base and, and do it effectively? I think the key is to communicate and communicate often and well with industry, you know, so that they can understand our requirements, they can understand uh, you know, how we need to leverage small business and what they bring to the table, and we can maximize competition. We benefit in the, up, in the way of policies and statutes. We have that, that Simca authority, single manager. We can buy for the other services. We have legislation that allows us to restrict competition, Section 806, to the, uh, to the national technology industrial base. We use all that to try and, and make uh, wise decisions, again, to protect the, uh, the industrial base. In terms of the strategy, you know, we put a lot of money into the organic industrial base, by $200 million a year to try and keep that current and, 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 and uh, able to support our future needs. We get together and do cross-leveling with the other services. We look what the other services have in the way of ammunition. If the Army needs it or, or they need some of our stuff, we do that cross-leveling, and we save about $175 million a year by that cross-leveling. We have semi-annual reviews that look at our, 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 our uh, stockpile, our consumption, and we re-zero our requirements and make sure that we, uh, we make uh, in, informed decisions. Some of the tools we use, industrial-based assessment tool, minimum sustaining rate model, these have all been developed over the last few years, and we partnered with JMC in, in using that so basically, you know, we firewall the data that comes in from industry. They populate it with what their requirements are, what their, what their capabilities are uh, from a personnel and equipment perspective, and, uh, and, uh, and we use those tools to, to uh, better forecast budget decisions and how it impacts the industrial base. And it, it is used to change decisions on what we buy. Um, Again, engagements with industry often, AUSA twice a year. Our Munitions Executive Summit is next week in, in Morristown, New Jersey. That's an annual event. We meet twice a year with our, our VPs in the ammunition, in, ammunition industry, the Industrial Committee of Ammunition Producers. We have an International Program Steering Committee where we, we integrate, we sit down with uh, industry representative, we integrate our FMS uh, with the direct commercial sale uh, 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 interest that, that industry has, and we try to make sure that we, uh, we integrate those so they're not spinning their wheels when the Army's doing FMS. We've instituted webinars where we go through sector by sector, whether they be fuses or bombs and warheads or propellants and energetics, and we, and we, we do webinars. We just started this this year, so to give the industrial base, commercial industrial base, a, a greater opportunity to, to get back to us with their issues and concerns. So it's, again, it's all about uh, you know, uh, in, uh, get, making informed decisions. And we use the information from these tools and from industry partners to make uh, acquisition strategy decisions so that we, uh, we kind of shape the, uh, the, the ammo industrial base and, uh, and make sure that uh, we're doing the best job we can to make sure we sustain future am ammunition capability for the warfighter. Ooh, good Thank job. You. Yeah. Jim? Yeah, I'm gonna, first of all, General Sullivan, thanks a lot. This is a great event, and oh, by the way, Huntsville's a great place. It is. <laughs> all right. And now, this, this is a little daunting because we have General Wagner here with the Wagner Study. If you hadn't read that, you ought to. Uh, as well as General Solomon, Defense Science Board, and all of the writings that he's done on this, and General Stevenson. So, uh, we got to be careful what I say here. Uh, so, let me let me just uh, start with um, what Pat said. Uh, exactly what she said is exactly what we need to do. Um, we, we cannot argue with the fact that the industrial base has surged two times, sometimes threefold, in the last 10 years for these two wars 
to meet the requirements that we needed to uh, meet, along with industry partners, in order to do that. And so I'm going to go through a little bit of what the uh, uh, Army Material Command's uh, pl strategic plan is that was developed. Uh, so there's actually people that read those plans, believe it or not. So that's good. You know, we're, we're talking about viable, effective, and efficient. All right. And so I, when I uh, I was I was a tactical guy until I went to JMC, and so I got Trish and Rhonda out there. I got to acknowledge them. They're the ones that taught me depot maintenance. Uh, and also that the fact that they could take over the world anytime they wanted to because they had all the ammunition. But that was another story. Uh, but I got the same speech. Yeah. <laughs> the, the real deal is, is that there's no question that we've got to have a viable, effective, and efficient operation. The question is, how do you get to that? Um, I, I will tell you that if you look at the strategic plan and you walk through the processes, we've got to continue to modernize. We can't modernize on our own. The dollars are just not there in the U.S. government to do that. You have to partner with industry where it makes sense to put that together and modernize in there, those areas that need to be modernized. And then I think we need to let go some of that that we, do, we just can't modernize and it's time for it to go. Because that's the second one, capacity. We all acknowledge what the great work was done over these last two wars. The, the two wars are going down. And we are way over capacity in our depots and our industrial base. And we've got to figure out how to properly utilize that. And I would argue it's not the government's problem, it's industry's problem as well. Because we've got to partner a little bit stronger than we have in the past in order to assure that we have the right capacity, whether that's in a depot or it's in an industrial base that our partners in industry have. And I'm going to use the, the analogy that was used by Mr. Guttner at the uh, small business forum that uh, General Vi had yesterday that was standing room only. Uh, it was a great forum. And he basically said he was excited because he met all the goals for 2013 because he made the uh, folks that were responsible, and I would argue that's ASALT and AMC, sign on the line that said they are going to do this together and they are going to meet the goals. We need the same thing with us signing on the line, industry, with government, with ASALT and AMC. If you're really going to get some action on this, we need to do that. And the policies and procedures that are defined in the strategy that need to change, I would argue don't need to be changed with just the government's input. It needs to be input from industry. And in fact, maybe that council that is meeting and the GOs and SESs ought to include industry partners, those that have partnered with you before, those that will par partner with you in the future, to see wh what is the right capacity between all of us and what are the right rules and regulations that we can set and what do we need to change in the laws because so many times we have been trying to partner when I was in that business and the law was thrown up and say, we really can't do that right now. Or, you know what, that's not the right depot to do that in. We really need to go and do that. Well, we have congressional support here, but we don't have it here. We have got to build up that capacity in order to ensure that we together can go down this path and we can surge when we need to surge. So we have to have an understanding of what our surge capability is throughout the country and not just in our depots and arsenals. And so I think this is more of a partnering together to develop and work the AMC strategy, which is very comprehensive. But I think now we need to do is instead of just doing this on the government and putting the government as the burden holder, let's put it on industry and government to solve this problem together. And I think you'll have a more powerful solution. Thanks, Jim. John? So good afternoon. Uh, I guess I'm thanks to AUSA for having this panel and for the invite. Uh, for my slides, if you'll go to the first one, um, many of these, these points have already been discussed at the previous panel, and I think uh, General McQuistian uh, talked a lot about these and some of the other speakers have as well. So I'm going to pick and choose, and I'm sure Jim will appreciate that, Jim. I need some points. So uh, let me start off with the first bullet. Um, I think General Christian gave some great examples of partnering in her, in her presentation. But let me talk about it from an acquisition standpoint. And I want to highlight uh, two people. Uh, Kevin Fahey, was, who was 
sitting probably in the same seat at the first panel, and Brigadier General Dave Bassett. These two individuals led the charge for JLTV, the Joint Light Tactical Vehicle, and brought industry in during one-on-one -on -one sessions with the government in a partnering fashion and allowed industry to highlight, in advance of the request for proposal being released to industry, significant cost drivers that, would, that were contained in the draft RFP. So what this allowed the government to do is to refine that request for proposal before it was released. And I think uh, the government is getting a much uh, more cost-constrained but still very positive and productive uh, product that meets the requirements, but they, they refine some of those requirements that threw the cost off the charts. So that's an example where in the acquisition arena, which doesn't happen very often because it's kind of the hands-off because of the competition rules, but if you do it before the RFP is released, it's a good news story, and I believe that that should be uh, instituted throughout uh, for future acquisitions. The other thing is going down to the fourth bullet, feedback from the field. This is critical to industry, and it must continue, because industry is just as committed to providing the soldier the best possible products as the government is. Many of us have worn the uniform, and we we have had the same pains that you go through today uh, in, your, in your respective jobs, but that, in, that industry feedback, or that uh, feedback from the government is extremely important so we, can, we know what needs to be done, we can, we can start looking ahead in terms of refining uh, our technology so that they're there and ready uh, in the future. And then going to number seven, uh, the seventh, bullet there, we understand very well that this partnering endeavor is not an either-or proposition. But I will tell you, from an industry perspective, sometimes it appears so. Because, you know, when we sit down with, with a depot, many times it's we're competing for the same resources and our, our respective survivals are at stake, and it's a challenge. So somehow we need, in some cases, I think some adult supervision at high places to help us come to closure in establishing those public-private partnerships that can truly benefit the government and help industry stay on board, maintain that, that core competency and capability that is so essential for the future, as well as the organic uh, base. And then lastly there on, on the international opportunities, we understand that there's no way that these, our international opportunities can ever make up for the downturn in the DOD budgets domestically. So we really need the government to step up and help us sell our products internationally. Be a spokesperson for U.S. industry because that goes a long way when it comes from the U.S. government to our allies. Now let me highlight a couple of challenges on the next chart. I already highlighted the fact that we're competing for the same resources, so there's a natural tendency or tension there, and it's something that we just have to work through. The other thing, going down to the intellectual property, there's a move afoot by the government to try to, to push hard against industry to, to free up indus the industrial uh, intellectual property. But as these budget tensions continue, I will tell you, we're going to push back as just as hard to protect that intellectual property because our livelihood is at stake. So somehow we've got to come to a meeting point and an agreement as to what intellectual property we will release and how the government is going to use it in the future. And that's all I'll say, and I'll turn it over Thanks to you. Thanks a lot, John. I appreciate it. Ted? Yes, sir. So thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to join you in this forum. I think these are absolutely essential in being able to, to lay the groundwork for partnering in the first place where we could establish uh, open dialogue. And I think this forum at AUSA is one of the uh, primary ways we can do this. 
Army Contracting Command provides about 65 percent of the Army's contracting support through its subordinate commands, uh, the Expeditionary Contracting Command, the Mission and Installation Contracting Command, and then the acquisition centers that support our major weapon systems. Um, you've heard a couple of people talk about uh, open dialogue and communications between industry and the government. And I think this is really one of the essential foundations for launching off into any kind of partnership. And it's one of the things, frankly, that, that we struggle with sometimes. I don't know how many times I've talked to industry representatives that say, you know, you're your contracting folks, they really are reluctant to, to talk to me and share information, and, and that goes with the PM community and so forth. And we do have the challenge of having to make sure that we maintain a transparent process and a level playing field. But within that construct, there's a lot more we could do, I think, to uh, open the dialogue between industry and, uh, and the government. I'll talk about some of the things that, that we and ACC are doing to try to uh, build that. Uh, we do a quarterly industry executive council where we rotate different industry leaders to come in and talk to our senior contracting leaders about challenges that they're having, procedural issues, uh, regulatory challenges, everything from how do we handle uh, sexual harassment in the contractor workforce, uh, things of mutual interest. Um, AMC does a quarterly CEO forum that brings in CEOs from different uh, companies. We focused on small business in the last one. Uh, we do a small business industry outreach several times a year across the country. In fact, AMC held a very successful small business industry outreach uh, two days ago at Redstone Arsenal. My commanders, the center directors and staff, along with 28 local DOD agencies, uh, had the opportunity to engage with over 300 large and small businesses, and the feedback was phenomenal. And I think we need to do more of this, and we need to focus it on particular um, functional areas and aspects of, of, of where we need to cooperate and work together. One of them could be public-private partnerships uh, within the uh, organic industrial base. Um, other mechanisms to improve industry dialogue are, as General Urias mentioned, a dialogue that occurs in a, in a major acquisition. First of all, doing a draft RFP and getting comments from industry. And then even taking the extra step and holding a conference to get feedback from industry after you've done that. And I think that, that pays huge dividends. And, and you heard uh, you know, his perspective as one uh, industry representative on doing that. Um, debriefings after uh, a, a, a proposal is over to be able to communicate you know, where a, a particular contractor fell short. We have a lot of folks that don't take advantage of that. And we have, on the government side, uh, we're reluctant to engage in those discussions, and we've got to do that. Army Contracting Command has supported numerous uh, industrial-based partnering efforts, and, and we've discussed that throughout the day uh, in support of major weapon systems. And ACC is kind of the nexus in a lot of ways between the acquisition community and the Army Materiel Command and uh, our industry partners, and so we, we get a chance to, I think, get an interesting perspective uh, when it comes to that. Um, a lot of the arrangements that we support are implemented under the Army Materiel Command's public-private partnership doctrine, uh, which offers the benefits of improving operational efficiencies, lowering costs. Uh, General McQuistion, I think, gave a really good uh, laydown of some of the successes that we've, that we've seen. Some of the areas of interest and, and challenges uh, from a contracting perspective uh, in executing uh, these partnership agreements uh, is determining workload split, um, some of the other things that affect our partnership are overhead rates, um, the workforce competencies involved on both the industry side and, and the organic uh, or, or government side, as well as key pro processes. Intellectual property is mentioned, and it's a big issue. Um, key critical facilities as well. And then also uh, the organic industrial base location relative to suppliers and other facilities uh, can also affect the process. In executing uh, public-private partnerships, uh, it's also uh, sometimes industry is not aware of which FAR requirements uh, are involved. For instance, uh, certified cost and pricing data and subcontracting plans uh, aren't required for depot public-private partnerships. Going forward, we've got a lot of challenges. Uh, the budget is coming down, as was said, um, but partnering probably offers us the best opportunity 
uh, to try to maintain uh, the limited uh, resources that we're going to have to be able to maintain in the coming years. Um, I'll basically cut my uh, comments short uh, in, uh, in respect of the time. I look forward to your questions during the Q&A session. Thank you. Thanks, Ted. Appreciate it. I'm sorry, Mr. Dwyer, your time's up. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, sir. Um, if I get my charts, uh, I'm Jim Dwyer. I'm the Deputy G3. I work for General Perna. Uh, and I'm going to give you just a, uh, basically a very redundant uh, pitch to what you heard from Chris Carlisle and General Mason this, uh, this morning and, and a much better briefing on it from our DCG just right before this. But if we can go to the next chart, please. Um, just to, uh, to highlight again and to, to be redundant because there will be a, a multiple choice test after this on partnering, I thought you'd all want to know. Um, we are open for business in the Army Material Command. All of our facilities are open for business. What on this chart we have portrayed are some of the centers, not all of our sites, and what they do for a living and what their core and site workload is. Uh, it is. It's amazing what they do and how well they do it. And what's not on this chart is the fact that every one of those sites is IS, uh, ISO 9000-2000 certified. Uh, they are safety certified. Uh, we have spent in Army Material Command about 10 years ago, as you heard, uh, we will have spent about $2.1 billion fielding an ERP system in this command that we started in 2003. We will finish in 2016 and will extend down to the shop floor. Uh, what I'm saying is it gives us unbelievable visibility into what we do and how we do it and how well we do it and the costs. So we, if you partner with us, and when you partner with us, we will be able to feed data to your ERP systems, we'll be able to pass forecasts to your ERP systems, parts forecasts, and we will be able to provide you the data so that if you want to do an IPR or a PMR or check on our progress for you, we can do that in language that you are familiar with using your ERP systems. It is an amazing uh, process in, in learning how to use uh, LMP but we have gone um, uh, to great strides to, to come into the 21st century on our business processes, and LMP is just uh, amazing. So what I wanted to tell you is, uh, as you heard from the DCG, paperwork doesn't mean it has to take um, a long time to partner. We can do this very quickly. The colonels at these sites can sign the contracts. They have the power to do that. What we have asked them to do is to stay in their core and site capabilities, to not compete against one another. We're not going to go back to the way it was before the war. Um, yeah, but they can very quickly turn proposals around for you. So that's, that's the good news. Next chart, please. Uh, that's, these are just some of the very high technology tools that we have invested in since the beginning of the war. Uh, and you can see and in the book that the, uh, the DCG held up and put on a chart that you can get next door list the capabilities uh, in more detail, but what we have is our extremely high-tech tooling uh, to match the high-tech uh, skills that we have in our workforce. Next, please. Just to highlight again for you, we've invested just in the organic side uh, almost $1.9 billion since uh, 2000, and most of that is in tooling and in small facility upgrades. As you can see, about a half a billion dollars in MCA. And that's just on the organic side. Um, on the ammunition side, in the government-owned contractor operated, they've invested about $1.8 billion uh, in facilities and tooling to bring up uh, those capabilities since the beginning of the war. So you do the math, almost $4 billion of investments in tooling that we have available for partnering. Why should you depreciate it, write it off, and make your stockholders buy it when we've already got it and, we're, and, and, and they're there for, the, for partnering? So just to be uh, uh, redundant one more time, we've made the investment, we've got the skills, we know how to use it, our ERPs can talk to you. We are basically into the 21st century, uh, and so we are open for business. And because General Pearls Mason said I had two minutes left, that's, I'll give it back to you, sir. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. Wimpy? I want to add my thanks. Uh, General Sullivan, for inviting me to come down. I, I really appreciate it. I wish you would have allowed me to stay more than a day, but uh, I'll take what I can get. One day out of the Pentagon is a day out of the Pentagon. And I apologize for keeping you waiting on the bus yesterday. Um, if I'd have known you were on there, I would have got there on time. That's an inside joke for the rest of you. Uh, they were calling for me, and I was wandering around the airport. 
They were all waiting on the bus. Um, I was hoping Vicki would come back because uh, I feel more comfortable with her in the room. I wanted another fellow lower Alabamian. Hey, here. Wimpy, Wimpy, yeah. Wimpy. She's right over Where there. Where you at, girl? Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I see you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to uh, just charge everyone in here that we should not forget what, what was said at that earlier panel, especially what Ms. Plunkett said to us. This is a real big issue that we're talking about here. I mean, it's big to us because we're concerned about our organic industrial base. But um, the organic industrial base is only a small part of the defense industrial base. Each one of the other services has a organic industrial base. And then there is the big defense industrial base, which includes all of these OEMs and other people out there. Uh, the top 10, if you look at, their, look at their income, they closely align between the services uh, for, I think, for three of the services, the, the, the way I looked at it anyway, as far as the dollar value and that sort of thing. And uh, I certainly uh, appreciate all of the partnering efforts that have, been, that, that have been struck and that are in place and they're succeeding and they're in pretty good shape. But if you narrow the thing down, I think what we're, uh, what we're talking about here is our maintenance depots are in pretty good shape. Legislatively, uh, people like Vicki and others have taken real good care of it. They've given you 6% six, 6 to keep them modern and uh, you know, to put the investment back to the point that we're crying uncle and saying that's too much and we'd kind of like to target it or you know, make it a lesser amount. Uh, you know, not for the past accomplishments, but for the, uh, the amount that's going to be accomplished in the future. But if you look at the arsenals, uh, the arsenals are a big problem for us, uh, not only politically, but uh, also for the workload. Manufacturing is down all over. What you heard uh, Mike Cannon say this morning was, the, you know, a very bleak forecast about what is going to be manufactured, and uh, they're, they're in a big hurt. And if you look at uh, Water of Elite and, uh, and Rock Island especially, theirs uh, kind of reflect the same thing. So I, in humor, uh, wrote a little question out for uh, Jim Pillsbury to ask you, General, a question, uh, uh, you know, how, if I was a uh, manufacturer, if I was a small business out there, how would I, who would I go see to uh, uh, strike a partnership or, uh, you know, do a deal? And um, he, didn't, he didn't let me turn it in because I signed his name to it. But uh, then he found on page seven that you've actually got it outlined there. And for those of you who have the book, I, I uh, invite you to take a look at that. It's in there on page seven. It tells you how to do it. But uh, I bet if you're a contractor, not too many of you would do that because it's pretty complex. And we probably owe it to to our OEMs and uh, our brethren out there in the defense industry to make it easier to, to get to us to do a deal, if you will. And I don't know what the answer of that is. We had a depot systems command at one time and all of them belonged to them. I'm, I'm not sure that's the right answer and I'm not even suggesting it. I'm just saying that that might be a little bit too hard to do. Um, I, I certainly agree with your comments and comment that someone else made earlier that there ought to be earlier involvement uh, for the organic industrial base when we're doing the acquisition plan, especially when we're doing the sustainment plan and that sort of thing. And for the arsenals, they need to be uh, Johnny on the spot with uh, before the RFP is rela released as well, if we're going to use them. And perhaps we ought to uh, consider doing the way one of the LCMC uh, does and uh, write it into the RFPs uh, that you get extra credit for using an organic facility, namely Toby Hanna, I think is probably the one that, that is targeted there because that's electronic gear. But I think it's a good idea and it might in fact save, uh, save some things. And I don't have all the answers, but those were things that struck me. Um, so I think both the acquisition and, or the uh, arsenals and the depots ought to be involved in the acquisition process and early on, just like the, uh, uh, the example that was given for the JTLV, uh, uh, getting the contractors in as the RFP is being constructed, but before it is released. 
And I don't know if you remember, but when uh, Dr. O'Neill was here, we actually pulled an RFP back for the GCV and uh, got more involvement of a lot of people. And uh, General Wagner, uh, I think, concentrated a little bit of that in, in his study, uh, the Decker-Wagner uh, study, and, and used some examples from, from that sort of thing, I think. We've got core for the depots, and that, or to the earlier remark about that's going to kind of keep them uh, in pretty good shape as far as the amount of work that is going to be done. Although the core is going to come down in the future as the force structure comes down, the number of systems are going to come down, and it's going to have to be relooked. It's probably uh, much too high right now than what it is, and that's going to cause some angst and, um, and other things in the, in the depots. I think our ammunition plants, when I, when I remember when General Shinseki left as the chief of staff and uh, ammunition was a real big problem in the Army, we were living off of the stockpiles from long ago and we brought it down to such a point that we, uh, we had a real, real challenge in going into the, uh, going into the war. So uh, critical capabilities uh, for the ammunition plants and for the arsenals. But, uh, but we're not manufacturing very much stuff. And I think the demand for ammunition is going to come down. So we're going to have some challenges there. So to me, I think we've all got to put our, put our heads together and work real hard to figure out a way. And we've got to make it easier for our industry partners to come to us and to strike a deal and to even identify what it is that they'd like to do or make a proposal, if you will. Um, but I don't want to leave on a negative note because I think we're doing a lot of great stuff. And I commend AMC for what they've done uh, in the area of partnering. And I think we need to help. Uh, we need to help from the building in a policy point of view. And, and Chris Lowman is sitting out there, and I give him total credit for the organic industrial base strategic plan. And Jim Rogers said that he might have actually read the thing. Some people did read it. Uh, it may not be the greatest document in the world, but it's all we've got, and it will serve as a guide, uh, and it can certainly be improved in the future. And I would say that one of the best examples of partnering that is ongoing today is the partnering that's going on between those LCMC commanders and their PEOs. I've never seen it better across the board. Some are much better than others, but there is none that are bad. And so I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Wimpy. I appreciate it. Can you get that in writing that he commends AMC uh, for its public? You got it? Good, good. I am an alumni of AMC, and my former commander is sitting right there, General Wagner. Oh, great. Super. We, we got a couple of questions. The first one, it doesn't have to do with the subject, and it's, and it's addressed to non-U.S. government folks. And it's kind of interesting, and I think uh, Ms. Plunkett might be very interested in, in uh, this question. How do we keep Congress from forcing the Army to buy stuff to fight the last war, stuff that's obsolete, tanks, et cetera, rather than future R&D? Um, it's a great question. Uh, and, 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 while, and I will take a stab at this. While we're not allowed to lobby the Congress in uniform, certainly we can educate, and that's what AUSA does very, very well. And, and, that, and then industry can also help with that uh, in that regard. But at the end of the day, the people that write the checks are going to, are going to have a say in, in what, is, what is going to be fielded to all the four services. Um, I don't know if anybody else want to take a, take a stab at that? No, Vicki, you want to take a stab at it? <laughs> no? OK. James? Uh, the question here is, how can industry help us lower the overhead costs at the organic uh, facilities? And I guess, obviously, I think the, the bit, single biggest thing I think will be done is to bring in more commercial work. And I think uh, General McQuishan uh, talked about $100 million that ATK was, uh, uh, was investing into the uh, Lake City facility. Uh, that, that's just a, uh, a huge success story. And it's actually a watershed year for Lake City because this year marks the point where there's more commercial production being done at Lake City than there is military production. So, I mean, that, that, that's a hugely good news story. Some other things, at, at Scranton Army Ammunition Plant, you know, they had a, a lot of work. It's dried up right now, but uh, two, three years ago, a large portion of the overhead costs at, at Scranton were being picked up through the, uh, the, the fracking industry. 
they were manufacturing high, you know, uh, forged high pressure fittings and, and, and piping and the like, and uh, and that offset a, a huge amount of the cost. So there, you know, the, anytime you can bring in that kind of work into an organic facility, it certainly uh, it helps lower the overhead costs and, and pay a lot of the bills and make the ammunition that we buy uh, cheaper. Another thing that we, we do is that we have a modest amount of money, about I think about $5 million a year for armament, retooling, and manufacturing uh, support. And that really is, is bringing tenants into the, uh, uh, the facilities to offset some of the costs. And I, I think uh, you know, there's probably more that could be done there to, to make those, our facilities more attractive for commercial uh, exploitation. And, and I think you know, if, if we invested a little bit more money there, th there'd, be, there'd be greater payback in, in, the, uh, in the long run by, uh, by investing in uh, a little bit more money in that arms program. Another thing we can do is, uh, is you know, we have a Tiger team going on right now that's looking at all of the requirements that we impose in our organic facilities in terms of you know, fire, security, environmental safety. And I think if you talk to our commercial partners, they'll tell you that the, uh, the requirements that are levied upon them are, are, are in, in way in excess of what they do in, for their commercial ammunition plants. And so I, you know, I think that you know, there's, uh, there's, there's, there's an opportunity there to, for industry to push back and, and challenge some of the uh, requirements that we place upon them and try and lower some of the, uh, the operating costs at, at our, our GOCO facilities. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has anything they'd like to add. OK, Ted? Yes, sir. So my question reads, uh, with funding constraints on the warfighter, why is there no discussion of the competitive sourcing provisions of A-76? A conservative estimate of the personnel savings based on Army's 330,000 civil servants would be about $7.5 billion and even greater DOD-wide. For true, quote, partnership, can we not include the, all these resources? So that's probably a little bit beyond the scope of the, uh, the, the forum, but I think I'll answer that in a little bit different way. Um, you know, we've contracted out uh, um, previously um, government performed functions over the last 10 years uh, in pursuit of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, some of these functions very successfully. We contracted out things that we wouldn't have dreamed we would have contracted out 20 years ago. Information operations, IT, security, and, and things like that. And, um, and I think we're doing some second guessing on, on some of those things. Uh, some of those things were very successful, by the way. Some of the things that concern me is uh, some of the knowledge-based services that we use, um, uh, especially in the development of weapon systems. And I do worry about our internal ability to develop requirements and do things like that. So I don't know if anybody wants to uh, comment on the A-76 part or, or just the general issue of, of, of contracting out versus insourcing. It's a big issue, and it's something that, that I think we need to uh, take a hard look at after 10 years of war. Great. Okay, got a couple here. Um, Mr. Pibus, you, you mentioned that it's hard to, to sometimes get, get into the, the nuts and bolts of partnering with, uh, with the Army uh, if you are a small business or even a, a medium to large business. How would you suggest that uh, we, we tackle that issue and, and, and um, what do you see an outcome of, uh, of a future change in policy, if you will? I'm, I'm not going to prescribe a, uh, a solution, but I think we need, a, uh, we need a single office within the Army, and it probably should be at AMC, um, that uh, anybody can pick up the phone and, uh, and get, a, you know, get a real person on the other end there, and uh, that will listen, you know, listen to a uh, contractor or an OEM and, and uh, either route them to the right place or go find the right person to talk to them and have them call back and, uh, you know, pursue it, run it to ground. If, uh, if you tell someone, go fill out a form and uh, go contact here and go find, what if he goes to the wrong LCMC and, uh, and all that sort of thing. We get calls in the Pentagon and, uh, that, that we send out uh, to, to hopefully to the right place, and I send them to the PEOs and stuff like that. I have a favorite saying is, no good idea ever originated in the Pentagon. And uh, <laughs> but let me find you the right person that you can talk to. And by the way, anything that uh, originates in the Pentagon that goes down probably is going to fall on, you know, some non-receptive ears. And, and if, they've got a good, if they've got a good thing, it'll come back. I, uh, I'm surprised this subject came up. Uh, I get calls all the time from people, members, sustaining members of people fishing. 
And I used to refer him to Lou Ashley, who was the AMC ombudsman, and that tells me it's uh, actually been beaten up. That was your single point then. Until he right, left. the ombudsman's office is our single point. If you don't already have a contact and you're not already actively working, if you have any questions uh, about any AMC capabilities, a single entry point can be our ombudsman's office. That's Jesse Barber, and uh, they are um, we will have them come and make contact and uh, make sure that you have their cards as well <laughs> Wimpy, um, to help pass those out. But yes, we do have a dedicated office for this purpose. And what they're going to do is, as you say, connect the right dots. They're going to get with Jim Dwyer and his folks, and they're going to uh, take a look at what the requirements are and then start making the connections with the LCMCs. Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pat. Um, John Urias, you mentioned in your presentation the importance of the Army discussing with industry the requirements for the JLTV uh, as they were being finalized. Can you elaborate on, on what, what and how the discussion went? Yes. Um, actually, um, both individuals that I mentioned, Kevin Fahey and uh, now Brigadier General Dave Bassett, they really bucked the chain because the, the normal bureaucracy would have not allowed those meetings to occur. But all of the potential offerers were allowed to come forward. These were one-on-one -on -one sessions. They were, and it was government to that particular com company. And the agreement was that uh, none of that information that we provided the government would be shared with the other members of industry. So we felt very comfortable in coming forward and laying on the table those huge cost drivers, which are very, you know, if you look at uh, past history, uh, you know, you, you start out with a program, you want everything but the kitchen sink in there from a requirement standpoint, and then you're surprised when the cost is off the chart. And so what, what uh, Kevin and, and Dave tried to do was get an understanding of those cost drivers in advance of the release of the RFP so that they could still make sure, going to TRADOC, that uh, the end state was going to still meet the requirements, but that the costs would be uh, more, better contained. And so I applaud what they did, and I really think that uh, that was a culture change for me, having been a PEO. I never saw that in six years as a PEO, and uh, I really applaud that effort, and I think we ought to look at that in institutionalizing it for any new start program. Ooh. 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 Please. Also apply that when you have your industry uh, to government meetings. Uh, I've seen too many of these where they bring in all of the industry, they talk to them, and then ask them for comments. You're never going to get comments from industry when they're competing with each other. Do it like the IED people do. They would have a half day or a day meeting, lay out what they needed, then they would have individual meetings with each of the industry members to get their ideas. Uh, you're just wasting your time thinking they're going to tell you what they want, what their ideas are in front of other industry. Finally, uh, pick your lawyers carefully. You got too many of them that can say no and not enough to tell you how. Yeah. Can I add one more? Please comment? go ahead. Uh, rebuttal, well, rebuttal, Senator. <laughs> so one thing I wanted to add is uh, we've actually seen this, an example of the, what was done with JLTV in Canada. So the news is getting out. And so recently we competed for a program in Canada, and we advised them. They were looking to how to reduce cost. So one of the individuals called me. I said, use the JLTV model, and they did. So uh, I, I think the news is out. I think it's a good news story, and it's something that we need to institutionalize. If I could just ask, Please. we've been doing that in POM as well for, for a number of years. You know, we, we hold uh, bidders conferences. Uh, we have issued draft RFPs. We have two or three meetings before the release of the final RFP. When it comes to our GOCO uh, facilities, when we, bid, when we put that contract on the street, uh, we, we have uh, site visits where the, the bidders can come and they can walk around the plant, and, and not just one, but multiple site visits. So I think, sir, I think that's something that's, that's gained uh, a little momentum over the last three, four, five years, and it is becoming more and more routine within the acquisition community. The, the munitions task force? The, the munitions industrial base task force? 
Yeah, that, that's, that's a, a body that we use uh, to reach out to, to industry, and uh, they represent, they, we actually have uh, Rich Palachuk, uh, I guess, has that up, and uh, he represents the interests of the ammunition uh, as, uh, world as a whole, and, uh, and uh, you know, we interface regularly with him. Rich is actually uh, participates in those international program steering committees that I, I talked about earlier, where we lay out the, the government's intent with regard to F FMS uh, opportunities, and he brings forth industries, you know, uh, interest in direct commercial sales. And we, we want to make sure we don't get sideways. And we want to make sure that we're integrated and, and supportive of each other and not working against each other. So, you know, he's an important conduit to, uh, to the munitions uh, 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 community for, for the government to, to the commercial side. Thanks. Last question, and, and it's going to go to uh, General Perna and to Jim Dwyer and, and General Rogers and, 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 and Wimpy, of course, if he wants to chime in. But one of the lessons that we have learned from this protracted com combat is that we ramped up our industrial base, organic industrial base, with, with permanence, temps, and terms, and then, had, and then during the drawdown, it was a rather precipitous drop in, uh, in, in manpower for all the right reasons. Can public partner, public-private partnership help fill that gap in our next conflict? And if so, how best to go about doing that? Yeah, actually, that, that was done even for this one. I mean, we, we did do some temps, obviously, for those uh, particularly those that we deployed overseas in some of our depots, we, we, we actually used those as temps. And if you were over there, you, you actually got, when you talked to the individuals, they were very excited to hope that they would get a permanent job when they came home. And we tried to do that where we could. But the other piece of that is, as our depots ramped up, one of the things we did was is we tried to ramp up with an industrial partner so that when we did go down, and we knew we were going to come down someday, and it would probably be an ugly ramp, which, which it is, uh, because we got to get everything fixed first, and then after that, you kind of look on the other edge and there's nothing there. And so we, we actually, um, most of the depots, some did not do this, and, and they're paying the price now, most of them brought in a partner and said, I'm going to use you for three to five years. I'm just going to tell you up front that you are an augmentation to our government force, and when that workload goes down, the contract's going to be turned off. And uh, we, will tell, we will tell you as, as soon as we know. Um, but what that did was that allowed us to keep our permanent employees on and kept the core at, it, at the, approximately the right level uh, so that we didn't have to lay off as many of our government employees. And we, we were very upfront with the contractors that we hired uh, that we would, uh, there would be a time when we would have to draw that down and it would probably come quickly. So it worked. Not, not without angst, because when you do that, you have to notify folks that own that district and they got a little excited. But uh, we've been reminding them, uh, I mean, at AMCOM, I was there for two years and it started on year one saying, we are going to go down in manpower, we are going to go, and we did it every six months. And, and they still didn't believe it when it occurred, but at least we could reference back to tell them two years ago, we, we started telling them that it was gonna go down soon. And it, it was about three years out. Okay, well, that's good. Sir, that's exactly correct. Uh, we, the organic base doubled, literally doubled its direct labor hours within two years. Could not have done that without the partnering of some great firms out there that uh, came through very, very quickly. And, and gave us the temps and terms, but we're very skilled at that. And, and not only that, we were able to double the output, but we were also still able to reduce safety issues and still uh, save um, millions, hundreds of millions in Lean Six Sigma because we, uh, right. we had the right partners. Good. Sir? General Sullivan, I believe that's, uh, that's the last question we got.